Good morning, and the Lord be with you. I thought it would be a nice idea to look at each of the Gospels in turn. And firstly, I want to begin with the Gospel of Mark, because Mark is the Gospel for next year, starting in Advent, in a couple of months' time. And I think it's useful to have an idea of the Gospel as a whole when we read each of the little extracts from the Gospel on the Sundays and the other days at Mass. Almost all we know about the life and teaching of Jesus comes from the four Gospels. In ordinary life, if several people are recounting the same incidents, the accounts will be different. One may be as dull as ditch water, and another riotously funny. A policeman's account of a traffic accident is quite different from the account given by the mother of the victim. We can be sure, we can't be sure at any rate with the Gospels that any of the Gospel writers actually knew and saw Jesus. I'll say more about that later. But Mark certainly never claims to have met Jesus. The stories are told and retold by those who are spreading the good news about Jesus. And at a certain time, probably when the first generation of followers of Jesus were getting older, someone must have come to a Christian called Mark, which is a very common name in the Roman world, and several different Marks in the New Testament. Someone came to someone called Mark and said, Mark, you're a superb storyteller, a gripping storyteller. Will you please collect and write down the stories about Jesus, which we all know, which we've all heard. Please write them down in one coherent narrative. Now Mark has his own special technique of telling a story. We, each of us has an own, an, own, an own technique. He has favorite expressions like at once, which comes 11 times in chapter one, and gives an air of urgency to the whole account then he likes to zoom in on a visual object. Jesus was in the stern with his head on a cushion, asleep. The fierce demoniac at Jerusa snapped the cords and rubbed away the fetters which were meant to hold him. Or Herod's soldier comes in brandishing the bloody head of John the Baptist, the bleeding head of John the Baptist. He likes to focus in on one particular object. Another thing, Mark often adds a little explanation afterwards, as though he'd forgotten to say something. The first disciples left everything, for they were fishermen, I forgot to tell you. The women at the tomb were worried about the weight of the stone, for it was very big, I forgot to tell you. He adds that for something or other. Mark doesn't necessarily tell the story in chronological order. He likes to group things. So he begins Jesus' ministry with a sample day of Jesus working on the Sabbath in Capernaum, with the wonder and amazement of Jesus' personality growing in each incident. And that's the beginning of the Gospel, as we begin to see the wonder of Jesus. First he heals. That's pretty something. Then he teaches, not like, the other, not like the scribes and Pharisees who say, Rabbi X says this, Rabbi Y says that, Rabbi Z says the other. I say to you, he has an air of authority. And then he forgives sins. Oh, who does he think he is? Only God forgives sins. And then he changes the Sabbath. The Son of Man is master of the Sabbath. The Son of Man has authority. Um, and then the storm at, the, at sea, and Jesus comes and calms the storm. So he, he groups things and he has a crescendo going on. And for instance, other things, the balance. At the beginning, there is the group of controversies, two, one to three, six, with the leaders, the Jewish leaders in Galilee. Then at the end, in chapter 12, the second half of the story, there's, that is balanced by a group of controversies with the leaders, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. So, 
It's a carefully built up story. And he has a group of collect a collection of parables in chapter 4. So he collects for the sake of the story. A special technique in Mark is sandwiching. Sandwiches. He puts one little story between two halves of another to show that they belong together. So he puts the incident of the woman with the haemorrhage, the cure of the woman with the haemorrhage, between the two halves of the cure bringing back to life of the, of the daughter of Jairus. He sandwiches the cleansing of the temple between the two halves of the withered fig tree and its comment. So he's showing that the withered fig tree is the image of the withered worship in the temple, that the worship in the temple is withered and is no good any more than the fig tree. He sandwiches between the parable and the sower the explanation of why people don't understand the parables, because Isaiah said that they wouldn't. They would look and look and not see, search and search, listen and listen and not hear. That was bound to happen, so it's by, on the authority of Scripture. And he sandwiches the one between the other two halves. That Isaiah explanation must have been common among the first Christians, that the Jews would not understand because it was hated in the Scriptures. It comes at the end of Jesus' ministry in St John, it comes at the very end of the Acts of the Apostles, when Paul says, I should have known. After all, Isaiah said, you will look and look and not see, search and search and not understand. But the most special of all Mark's techniques is irony. He's working on two levels, the levels of the actors in the story and the level of the hearers or readers of the gospel. You and I know more than the actors on the ground do, and we watch them learning. Slowly, slowly, slowly. So, when the first disciples follow this casual passerby at the lakeside, they have no idea what's going on. There's no suggestion that they've been present at the baptism of Jesus, but we, the readers, know what's happened. When the Gerasene demoniac calls out, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? The hearers on the ground don't seem to hear. We know what this means, son of the Most High God. They don't. When the high priest's servants mock Jesus as a prophet, we know that at this moment Peter is fulfilling the prophecy that he will betray Jesus. But the actors on the ground don't know, so they can mock him as a prophet when his prophecy is being fulfilled. When the centurion at the foot of the cross appreciatively says, in truth, this man was son of God. We know the full meaning of his words more than he does himself. So it's all on two levels. So linguistically, Mark is primitive enough. He writes in the rough language which would have been used by the slave classes. And there were a lot of Christians in the slave classes. Used by the slave classes all around the Mediterranean. But his patterning is far from primitive. It's highly sophisticated. And the most salient pattern of all, which you can't miss but which is worth speaking of, is the slowness of the disciples to understand who Jesus is. The turning point is Caesarea Philippi in chapter 8, towards the end of chapter 8. Before then, Jesus has three times upbraided, told off the disciples, do you still not understand? Do you still not realise? And each time on the lake, on the Lake of Galilee. And that's a pattern which he does. Then, after that, the blind man at Bethsaida receives his sight in two stages. A highly symbolic placing of the story. It's not an invention of the story, it's where it's placed that is invented. And at last Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah. But they still don't understand what this means. They have the common understanding of Messiah as a triumphant king. So Peter can't tolerate the idea of Jesus suffering, and Jesus smacks him on the wrist. 
you have the wrong idea of the Messiah. The Messiah can reach his resurrection only after suffering and death. And this prophecy is repeated three times to the disciples, and each time they fail to understand or simply ignore it. Why this stress, which dominates the whole Gospel? Is it because the idea of a suffering Messiah was so paradoxical at the time? Is it because Jesus' idea of his mission was so different from the conventional conception of a Messiah? Or is it because we all, all the followers of Jesus, find it so difficult and uncongenial to accept the idea that we too must share the suffering of Jesus? Or is it all those three lessons together? So the idea which dominates the Gospel is the gradual revelation of who Jesus is. He rejects any messianic title offered. Only at the baptism does the reader hear, You are my son, the beloved. We, the readers, hear it, but the disciples didn't hear it. What does this mean? You are my beloved son. Jesus is not physically a son of God, as though he was generated by God in the way that we human beings are generated by our fathers. Son of has a far wider meaning. In English, we can say he's a son of the soil, meaning a true, devoted and dedicated farmer. Or a loving mother can say, oh, you really are your father's son. That means there's much more to it than generations imitating, loving, trying to live up to, and so on. And the whole Gospel is dedicated to showing what it means to be Son of God. What it means in action. We have to watch out for the way Jesus behaves. He behaves with his teaching, his wondrous powers, his healings, his call to the poor and the outcasts. That's what a son of God does. That's what the meaning of son of God is. His forgiveness and his adjustments of the law. He has, the, as son of God, he has the, the ability and the right to change the law. He forgives sins. Only God forgives sins. So Jesus himself points out the difficulty of the idea that he's Messiah or that he's son of David. He doesn't want those. He never accepts those. No one seems to hear when the unclean spirits even cry out, Son of God. We're learning gradually what this means. What does Son of Man mean? Jesus him refers to himself only as Son of Man, and that rather obliquely. What does it mean? In Hebrew, it's used for the earthiness and the reality of a human being, a son of man, like a son of the soil, or you really are son of your father. Nothing special about him, he's a son of man. Just means he's a human being. In, in Jesus' own language of Aramaic, it can mean more than that. It can be used as a, we use one. One knows that such and such. I don't want to stress it's me, I don't want to claim anything special, but one knows that such and such. So it's a way of referring to oneself. The question is whether it's more than that, the Son of Man can do such and such. Is he referring to the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel 7.13, a figure in Daniel, the prophet Daniel's heavenly vision. Daniel sees one like a son of man coming to the one of great age on the clouds of heaven and receiving from God all power on earth. Is Jesus referring to that? This would fit in with his power, his claim of power to forgive sin, the son of man. Power also to be Lord of the Sabbath and change the Sabbath ruling both early in Mark's narrative. We learn only gradually who Jesus is and what Son of Man means. Jesus repeatedly tells his followers not to declare him openly 
till the Son of Man has risen from the dead. They won't understand him and his kingdom well enough to pass on the message until they've witnessed the death and resurrection of Jesus. The climax builds up as he finally journeys towards Jerusalem, southwards down the Jordan Valley, till they reach Jericho, and as they're leave, leaving Jericho, they turn right and start eastwards up the steep ravine, the Wadi Kilt, towards Jerusalem, just three hours walk, and it's a thrilling introduction to the climax of the Gospel. As they leave Jericho, Jesus is insistently hailed by Bartimaeus as son of David, Jesus restores his sight, and Bartimaeus follows them along the road. Then the real climax is in the scene, the set scene before the high priest, who asks Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies, adding, yes, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. At last the identity of Jesus is clear. Jesus is claiming to share the mobile throne of God coming on the clouds of heaven, seated at the right hand of the power. As God is seated on a mobile throne in the visions of Ezekiel. And it's for this blasphemy that he's condemned. They cry blasphemy and that he's hustled off to Pilate. So it's for his claim to be son of God, son of man in this extreme sense. So throughout the Gospel of Mark, we're discovering the wonder of Jesus, what his personality is, what his real powers are. I suggest on this home retreat that you could do nothing better than read the Gospel through, the Gospel of Mark, perhaps two sessions, have a break after Caesarea Philippi in 831, and then start again. But Discover the wonder of discovering who Jesus is and how the disciples see what he is and what his mission means. God bless you.